Mr. Yeshitela, I told you that the concept uh, of the times in, in the South is different than in another part of the world. Chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, founder of the Barn and Spear newspaper, which has published continuously since the 16th. Author of the powerful new book, One Africa, One Nation, 40 years of bold leadership and unwavering commitment to the struggle for the self-determination of the African community. Formerly known as Joseph Waller, the Fiori Jean leader of the Hunt of Militant Organizations in the 1960s, Omale Yeshitela is today a veteran in the struggle for African freedom giving continuity and experience. Chairman Omale Yeshitela has uh, built the African People's Socialist Party, founded in 1972, to complete the Black Revolution. Since that time, the African People's Socialist Party has established Uhuru House, black community organizing centers around the country, founded the National People's Democratic Uhuru Movement to defend the democratic rights of the Africa community and built economic institutions controlled by and benefiting the African working class, such as Uhuru Black Gym of our own in St. Petersburg, Florida, the African People's Socialist Party's national headquarters. Today, he is in Huelva with us. He has told me that this is the, our first visit in, in Spain, not only in Huelva, only in Spain, to in Spain, for contributing to our scientific works, but mainly for collaborating to our better understanding on Africa. Whatever you have the word. Thank you very much for coming. I would like to uh, thank you very much for the introduction and also to offer my profound thanks and appreciation to the organizers of this Congress. I would also like to uh, express my appreciation uh, to the other presenters uh, for this Congress and to all of you uh, for coming out uh, to share your time uh, with us uh, during this uh, very uh, significant event for the next few days. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that coming from the United States, I feel that it is absolutely necessary that I, I express my absolute in, uh, condemnation of uh, the U.S. aggression, occupation, new uh, colonization of Iraq and Afghanistan. I do not think it would be appropriate for me uh, leaving the United States to come and speak to such an august body without publicly expressing the fact that there are a number of us who live in the United States who are opposed to colonialism, however it looks, in whatever period of time it exists. So I want to say that first of all. Secondly, I would like to say that my uh, esteemed comrade here, when I first, when he, when we first met, uh, asked me the question of whether I am aware of the roots of my family in Africa. My answer is no. And beyond that, I told him that I am not curious as to where my family uh, comes from in Africa. And the reason I am not curious of where my family comes from in Africa 
is because Africa today, trapped in artificial borders created by imperialism in 1884 and 85, is too involved now with ethnic politics and politics based on some assumption to a relationship to an artificial nation which in most instances did not exist before the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 85. I am an African. That is good enough for me. I am one who understands that although I live in the United States of America, that it would be impossible for an African to get on a ship in Africa as an African to arrive in America uh, and become something else. If I was an African when I got on the ship in Africa, I had to be an African when I got off the ship in America. So we were Africans then, we are Africans now. And that is the perspective uh, that I come from. And I want to also say to you that my perspective is informed by philosophy, by an ideology. I do not pretend to speak to you uh, uh, as though uh, we do not live in a very real world and where the conditions that we are talking about in Africa uh, are not conditions uh, that uh, simply occurred, but they are conditions which have been imposed on Africa. And so I hope that those of you who have come out to this Congress are able to really uh, think of Africa in new ways. I'm hoping that people who have come here uh, did not come uh, with the anticipation of of being able to express more pity for Africa, it is my hope that you will become outraged if you are not already outraged by the relationship that Africa has to Europe, North America. I am politically influenced by philosophies of people like Marcus Garvey, Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Robert Mangalisa Sobukwe, and Malcolm X. These are some of my ideological parents. I am someone who uh, speaks to you as a social worker. I am a revolutionary. I am convinced that Europe, North America, do not have the ability to do right by Africa, but it is the responsibility of Africans, ourselves, to organize, to overturn the relationship that we have with Europe and with North America. Unfortunately, the last 500 years of history has been an, a, a history of imperialism. We wake up today in the 21st century and look out upon a world which has the, gives the impression of having always been like this. But it has not always been like this. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Africa is the richest continent on earth in terms of natural resources. 12 million square miles when you count the islands of natural resources, of tremendous wealth, a place where billions of dollars every year are taken from Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone as an example, in the form of diamonds on the one hand. But on the other hand, where the African workers who bring those diamonds to the surface, for Europe, for North America especially, are expected to live of 30 cents a day, and if they are lucky, a cup of rice. Africa is not poor. Africa is being looted. We talk about an Africa where each of us who has a cell phone, 
or I think they're referred to as mobiles here in Europe, has an instrument that requires for its workings a strategic mineral known as coltan. 87% of the world's coltan is located in what is now referred to as Democratic Republic of Congo. Since 1998, from five to seven million African people have died in Congo as a consequence of proxy wars being fought, among other things, for those resources. Africa is not poor. Africa is being looted. Not only looted of natural resources, but human resources as well. And this is something that has been going on for a very long time. So I'm hoping that this Congress will be able to look at the question of Africa, its relationship to the North, if you will, not through pitying eyes, but through eyes of outrage. I'm hoping that this Congress, at minimum, will bring people to a different consciousness about the relationship that Africa has to the world and perhaps allow us to come to some different conclusions about what it is that we can do uh, to change uh, this relationship. I come from the United States where oftentimes this country is referred to as a nation of immigrants. Perhaps you have heard of the United States being referred to as a nation of immigrants. Uh, it is a concept that we disagree with. We don't see the United States as being a nation of immigrants, rather we see it as a prison of nations. An entity that was founded as a consequence of an aggression that was made against the indigenous population there, who are called Indians now. The majority of the survivors are currently living in concentration camps that are known as reservations, where they have a lifespan in the 40s. They talk about the United States being a nation of immigrants, but I would tell you that African people who are in the United States did not come as immigrants, we came as captives. And our conditions of existence in the United States are conditions which stem from the relationship that the United States and Europe have with Africa. When we look at the conditions, when we look at Katrina, and I think many of you are familiar with the Hurricane Katrina and the consequences, the United States response that sent military troops in the cordon of the African people after having allowed uh, Africans uh, to die unnecessarily uh, in that. When we look at the Katrina, it's like looking at any other situation on the continent of Africa itself. Um, because the conditions of Africans in the United States is an extension of the conditions of Africa itself. That our relationship to imperialism is the same in the United States as it is in Africa. I should have said to you that it is impossible for an African in the United States to be an African American as we are sometimes called. Uh, to be uh, an African and American is an African American, we believe, uh, is the same as saying that someone is a slave and a slave master at the same time. Uh, it is impossible to be both a slave and a slave master. America built itself at the expense of Africa. And so we say that we are not African Americans, we are Africans. And we are Africans uh, regardless of, of whether or not uh, many of our people understand our historical relationship uh, with Africa, because the reality is that most of us have got our education in the United States, in Africa itself, from the colonizer who is responsible for our conditions. So we got the same education as you got. And when we were taught in schools, we were taught that slavery was something wonderful. In fact, even now, the president of France talks about how Africa has never brought any contribution to the world that is quite uncivilized. 
And, uh, and uh, the British and the French talk now about having to introduce into schools the benefits of colonialism, the goodness, the good things that colonialism did. My friends, the reality is this, that when Africans met Europe, it was not Africa who was poor. It was Europe that was poor. When Africans met Europe, it was not Africans who were unhealthy. It was Europe that was unhealthy. Uh, the reality is that when we met Europe, Europe lived during an era of feudalism. There was no freedom for Europeans. Uh, this concept of Europe visiting the rest of the world to, to bring us freedom and democracy, there was no freedom or democracy in Europe. When we met uh, Europe, uh, feudalism existed and the reign of the uh, kings and queens and nobility. It was during a time when kings would actually tell free men to shut up. Not the 21st century where free men tell kings to shut up, right? Uh, when we met Europe, when we met Europe, this was the reality, this was the reality. When we met Europe, there was no such thing as, as uh, ordinary Europeans owning your own homes, etc. This thing that we say, uh, there's a saying in the United States that um, a man's home is his castle. Uh, no, the castle was, the, was the, the place where the nobility uh, resided when we met Europe. Uh, the fact of the matter is between the four short years of 1347 and 1351, half the people in Europe died of plague. And for the next hundred years or more, Europe still suffered the consequence of that and several other plagues. You cannot, live, you cannot lose half your population in four years and have a viable economy, economic life. It was a poor and impoverished Europe that rescued itself from poverty and disease by the invasion of the rest of the world. We are told that, and I was taught this when I went to school, that Europeans came to Africa and came to the Americas to export uh, Christianity uh, and civilization. Uh, they had an abundance of such in the United States. And, uh, and this is why. But the reality is that Europe was impoverished and diseased. And uh, if it had anything to export, it was poverty and disease. Uh, but Europe, uh, with a vengeance, attacked the rest of the world. It attacked not only Africa, although we must talk about Africa because the conditions that we see confronting Africa today have their origin in history. It is not something that just materialized, as we are told, with corrupt leaders in Africa, etc. Uh, the corruption started a long time ago, and it was not in Africa. Uh, but we are talking about uh, 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 the wealth of an impoverished place, the development of an impoverished Europe, a place where up until the 17th century uh, did not exist as a concept. We're talking about Europe as a concept uh, and, and uh, which achieved its identity uh, as, a, as a concept through the process of slavery and colonialism. Prior to slavery and colonialism, Europeans identified themselves or defined themselves primarily in relationship to each other. It was only as a consequence of slavery, colonialism, the competing drive to capture human beings and the resources uh, from around the world uh, that Europe increasingly became, began to define itself not primarily in relationship to each other, but primarily in relationship to the rest of us, Africans and the rest of us. It was a process which saw the entire ecosystem of the Atlantic, the ecological system of the Atlantic Ocean change as a consequence of attack on Africa and African people being shipped across the Atlantic. Thousands and millions of whom would die in the process. Some 
thrown overboard, some refusing to go willingly and leaping overboard, some throwing their children overboard rather than see them go into slavery. Millions died. And the ship, the sharks, actually learned to follow those ships from Africa across the Atlantic. Schools of sharks would, would follow the ships that kept, had Af Africans who we call slaves uh, across, the sh across the Atlantic Ocean. There is, a, there is an umbilical cord connecting African people uh, in the Americas and Africa made of the skeletons crossing the Atlantic, a, a highway of bones of African people crossing the Atlantic Ocean. That is our connection. And that is something that I think is fundamentally important for us to understand when we start, when we look at where we are today, that it has its origin uh, some time ago in the history of this relationship. And so uh, we're talking about an aggression uh, that uh, against the China 1841-42, the so-called Opium War, uh, that turned China itself into a nation of drug addicts uh, for the benefit of England, which was a participant in the development of the entire economy of Europe. We're talking about France, which in addition to what it was doing in Africa, held Vietnam as a, as a colony, where for a hundred years or more, most of the colonial resources coming from Vietnam to France was in the form of opium, drugs. There were at least 3,000 legal opium dens in France and in Vietnam under French colonialism. We're talking about Portugal, which by 1500 had brought out some seven, this is Portugal alone, which by 1500 had brought out some 700 tons of gold from Africa. These are resources that went to developing Europe, a Europe that was impoverished, a Europe that was diseased, and a Europe that was unfree when we first came into contact with it. Where does the wealth come from that we are now treated as beggars uh, throughout the world? Uh, despite the fact that, that today Africa is so wealthy in terms of natural resources, we are treated as beggars across the world. We are in Spain as, uh, as uh, illegals. We are in, in England and France as illegals. Uh, there's a saying among Africans they say, we say, we are here because you were there. And uh, that, is, that is the reality that, uh, that we have to deal with. And so uh, I, I think it's necessary for us to talk about this because both Africans and non-Africans live under some kind of illusion about this relationship that somehow uh, getting to America, uh, getting to some place in Europe, uh, is our salvation. Uh, when we are in Africa, that is how we feel. And then those uh, Europeans and North Americans often feel also that somehow we are intruding on Europe and North America by being here and uh, somehow impacting upon the resources that ought naturally go to Europe and North America. But the truth of the matter is, when I walk through, down the streets in Amsterdam, and I see the incredible architecture and the obvious wealth, the magnificent uh, social system that takes care of their elderly, uh, give them, gives them uh, tremendous amounts of resources after they can no longer work. Uh, when I look at that, and I, 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 have, to, I am, have to recognize the fact that, that Holland built itself of slavery that the first Africans who came to North America came in slave ships from, from Holland, that Holland uh, took so many resources from what we now refer to as South Africa. Uh, and, and the fact is that Holland is not alone in this relationship to Africa. And not only did these things happen, 
But on the backs of this, we saw of the slavery and colonialism, we see the emergence of the Industrial Revolution that changed all of Europe. Uh, where when we met Europeans, the vast majority of the Europeans uh, lived as surfed, serfs, tied to the land in a feudal system, uh, not like slaves, but the next best, next closest things to slaves. Uh, they couldn't be sold uh, as Africans were later sold, but if the land were sold, they went with the land, tied to the land in that fashion, without freedom. And now we have the emergence of all these resources coming from Africa and from the rest of the world that begins to transform European society. I'm told and, 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 and was taught uh, through my education, which was a colonial education in the United States, that the European democracy and development occurred as a consequence of some really important ideas that Europeans had, Descartes, Rousseau, people like this, and they wrote incredibly significant things about uh, democracy, and this is the thing that led to the, the bourgeois or, or democratic revolutions of Europe. But I really suspect that one of the things that had something to do with transformation in Europe was all of the resources that were now coming into Europe, not, uh, and, and resources that actually challenged the nobility throughout Europe, challenged feudalism throughout Europe, uh, so that you have these new entrepreneurs. Some of them were pirates. Uh, some of them uh, 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 were adventurers uh, who were able to get money from the queen to discover new worlds, uh, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, uh, you saw a new group uh, developing. And they began over a period of time to bring so much wealth uh, to Europe that they became wealthier even than the nobility. And uh, a, a feudal system that placed restrictions, limitations, on the development of a whole new social force, a whole new mode of production that overturned feudalism. This is the basis for the overturn of feudalism and the development of what we characterize as democracy and a whole new social system. It is wealth that came from Africa and from other places in the world. And this, of course, is responsible for the transformation of conditions in Africa and the rest of the world and why we live today in a world where at least half the people on this planet live off less than $2 a day, two U.S. dollars a day. And if you keep up with the newspaper, you know that the U.S. dollar continues to decline in value, so two U.S. dollars is not much. Uh, and, and when you look in Africa, you find that Africans live off a dollar a day on average. Uh, where in Europe, uh, cows uh, have an allocation of uh, $2 a day. So that a cow in Europe has available to it more resources than an African in Africa. There's something wrong with that relationship. And it is a relationship that is, that is, that is reinforced and maintained at gunpoint. 1960s, all of us saw so much hope for our Africa. Sajifo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, being such a shining example who fought for uh, united Africa. Uh, people like Patrice Lumumba, great patriots who loved Africa and died uh, for Africa. And there were others, countless numbers of others. Uh, we had so much hope for our Africa. And then, of course, what we saw was a, a terrible aggression against Africa. We are in this Congress now to talk about the, the relationships between North and South, but these are relationships which are imposed at gunpoint. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown by the United States government. It, manual, it created the coup. The United States government, France, and Belgium were actually engaged in a race to see who could kill Lumumba first. This is an objective reality. I mean, this is, there's evidence of this today. I'm not telling anybody something that's a secret, right? Why? Because Nkrumah said that the wealth of Africa should belong to Africa and African people. And because Nkrumah understood that the colonial borders that had been created by imperialism uh, locked us into poverty 
and said that the only way Africa could survive and move into the future was through being united and liberated. And because Lumumba stood for the same thing and people like, uh, like Rousseau Pukwe in South Africa and others. This is, this is what we are contending with. It is no accident. Africa did not volunteer for this. Africa brought, it is the place on earth. Even the most rabid reactionary, frothing at the mouth, right wing forces throughout Europe and North America have to admit today that, that, that human life itself originated in Africa, which tells us that Africa is not hostile to life. It is the place on earth that is naturally the friendliest uh, to life itself. Was nobody from Manchester in England or Paris in France that went to Africa and created life? Life emerged in Africa. Civilization emerged in Africa. Great civilizations. So why is Africa poor today? I contend that there is a relationship between the poverty of Africa and the wealth of Europe and North America. And this relationship is tied to slavery, to colonialism, and to instruments of coercion that have, created, that have been created in the wake of slavery and colonialism to keep Africa trapped in the place where it is today. Because Africa is trapped into a parasitic relationship with Europe and North America. And all of us know, we're in the university here, and I'm sure they teach us what parasitism is all about. That a parasite must necessarily have a host to live on. You can't convince a parasite to leave a host. You can't pray a parasite off a host. Parasites must have a host in order to live, to exist. So it seems to me, the questions that we are confronted with is what is responsibility of Africa first and African people? What must we do to change the reality that through most of Africa, we see African women who will work all day just to get enough food for that day? We see African children who work, walk miles to get water because there is no clean water in most of Africa. We see people who are trapped in the most miserable kind of poverty in a place that has so much wealth, even as they are sitting in a place where they see their resources, their wealth, leaving in lorries and trucks, going to Europe on a daily basis. We talk about immigrants. It is so difficult today for Africans to travel anywhere, to come to Spain, to come to the United States from Africa, to come to Europe in Africa. You can't come. You're, you're some kind of illegal. What we must tell them is when we come to here, we are chasing our own resources, which have been taken from Africa and transformed. You may have forgotten where they come from, but I remember. And those of us, all of us, have this responsibility. You don't have to be an African to hate this relationship. It is so easy for Europeans to sympathize with impoverished African people, send a dollar to help a poor, starving African child. It is so easy. But what we have to challenge is the relationship. You know the British story of Robin Hood who robs from the rich to give to the poor. That's not what we are about. We're not looking to rob from the rich to give to the poor. We must, be, we must have, assume the responsibility to change the world of rich and poor. So that those where all these resources are coming from also have a right to live. So this is my contention. My contention is that the governments 
whether in Africa, neo-colonial puppet governments, white power in blackface, most of them. Or the governments in Europe and North America, certainly not North America, will not do anything to change this relationship. But people can change this relationship. But in many instances, you have to be willing to go against what your government and what the corporations in your government recognize as their interests. Because as you know, George W. Bush and the one who came before him and before him and before him saw as what was in their natural interest all that is under the sands of people who live in Saudi Arabia and other places like that. Coltan that comes from Congo is seen as being their natural interest. Right now, the United States is creating this thing called AFRICOM, the Africa Command. Well, they will, we will create even more U.S. troops in Africa to control Africa. Right now, in the Gulf of Guinea, new, increasing U.S. military intervention. Of course, it has nothing to do with oil that they have found there. And the growing contest they have for oil with China, that is also oil hungry, right? We are told that they are doing this for our own good. Like when they first came and got us to, brought us to bring us to Christianity and civilization. We must say no. No to Africa. No to this imperialist intervention. We must do this. The countries and the governments won't do this. And I want to finally say this. The primary project that I'm working on is called the African Socialist International, where we have as an objective of organ organizing African revolutionary organizations everywhere on earth where African people live. I speak passionately about Africa and as our Africa, not as uh, some observer. We work uh, in Southern Africa and South Africa right now. We work in Swaziland as well. Uh, uh, we work in Kenya. Uh, we work in West Africa, in, in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Guinea Conakry. Uh, under the worst kinds of circumstances with puppet, under puppet governments that serve imperialism and not our own people. We work uh, in Europe and particularly in England and throughout uh, North America. And I'm sure that I have left something out, but our responsibility is to build the organization that Garvey and Nkrumah talked about. Africa will not be free. There is not going to be a, a free uh, Ghana or a free uh, Nigeria uh, separate from the rest of Africa and African people. Africa must be free. Africa must be united in order to even have access to its own resources. We live in a world today uh, where many Africans may even, some Africans may even disagree with this. They say, oh, I'm not, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Nigerian, I'm Sudan, I'm, I'm uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have no relationship to the rest of Africa. But even as we are having these silly arguments, there are, there are uh, Europeans from France, from North America, uh, from Germany, uh, from England, from Spain, from all these other places who are sucking the blood of Africa. And so they act like Pan-Africanists, <laughs> even as we run away from recognizing that our Africa uh, must be united and we have to fight for all of Africa. That is what we have to do. Uh, in order to be free, and African people uh, everywhere. So uh, that's, our, that's our primary project, is to unite, to, to build a, a revolutionary organization with the understanding that the freedom of Africa is going to have to be taken. It's not going to give, be given to us. And that we have to forge relationships with other freedom-loving people all over the world in this process. That's how I know who is my friend when I hear an argument between Hugo Chavez and, uh, and the King of Spain. We say, viva, viva Hugo Chavez. 
El presidente, el comandante. Uh, uh, that's how we know uh, where we stand, because we stand on the side of the future, and the future belongs to the oppressed peoples of the world. Uh, and we also say this, this thing finally. There's an issue that's assuming um, increasing significance in the world today. It is this question called reparations to repair the damage. And um, we have been involved uh, in this struggle for reparations for many, many, many years now. In fact, uh, our party contributed to uh, making the reparations issue a popular issue, taking it out of uh, back rooms and closets. In fact, uh, when we first started talking about reparations, we were considered a lunatic fringe who would talk about reparations. Um, but increasingly all over the world, this discussion is happening. And uh, right now, uh, we are involved in a project to develop um, a world uh, tribunal, an international tribunal on reparations for African people that will probably uh, occur in what we call South Africa now. And we think South Africa is an ideal place uh, to make this happen because it is one of the places where uh, um, there is uh, so much illusion uh, where we are now told that there is a rainbow coalition, a rainbow nation, where all the people are happy after the release of Nelson Mandela and the ascension of the African National Congress uh, to power. Of course, those are people who have not been there who say this. Those who have been there recognize that even today, in fact, when I was last there in 2000, and when I was there in 2004, rather, I read a poll uh, published by one of the South African newspapers that said in the 10 years at that time since the African National Congress had been to power, the African people had become 14% become poorer and the whites had become 19% richer. And uh, in what they call South Africa today, you have an unemployment rate of more than 50%, or 40% rather, and thousands of Africans who live uh, in these shanty towns made of scraps, etc. And uh, the people cannot see a future except for a handful of people who have been given tremendous resources in these economic scams that unites a sector of the African middle class with their imperialist overlords at the expense of the mass of African workers and poor people. And we think it's important to go to South Africa because there are still people in South Africa who are in prison, who uh, participated in the liberation struggle, even under the ANC government because they refused to participate in the so-called truth and reconciliation process where both the uh, South African regime and its uh, people who worked for it to keep African people oppressed and the people who fought against them are now uh, to confess the crimes that they committed. So somehow if you are a bank robber, you have to confess that you tried to rob a bank. And if you shot at the bank robber who was robbing the bank, you have to confess that you shot at the bank robber. So it equalizes both the actions of the oppressed and the oppressor. And so many people would not participate uh, in this process. They are in prison in South Africa today. There are scores of them still locked up. And so we think it's going to be really important to be able to do this tribunal on reparations for African people, for Africans from around the world to come together and among other things, to actually begin to quantify the amount of value that has been stolen from Africa and brought to Europe because there are many Africans who live under the illusion that we are poor. But we who have been to Spain, who have been to the United States, who have been to Europe, we can say Africa is not poor. Look at what Africa has produced. All right? And so we want to come together and we can document, we can begin to quantify the amount of value that has, has been taken from Africa. We can begin to expose uh, the audacity of a British government, of a US imperialism in Europe altogether, 
for claiming that Mugabe is the poster child for criminal behavior because they began to take land from the squatters, from the squatters who stole the land in the first place. Where we can begin to talk about how Cecil Rhodes, who introduced the Maxim machine gun to what, they now, what is now Zimbabwe, and on an afternoon would kill 5,000 Africans and then have champagne and tea afterwards. And how they brought mercenaries from England to whom they give thousands of acres of land to help for helping them to kill the Africans there to take the land. These are things that Africans need to understand and everybody else around the world needs to understand uh, as a part of our demand uh, for reparations. So, our dear friends, I've spoken for a long time, and my comrade here has been extremely patient. <laughs> and so have you been extremely patient uh, in listening to me. But I would like to extend my profound appreciation to all of you uh, for coming, and I do hope uh, that we can talk about this question of Africa, the conditions of existence in Africa, right, in a more meaningful way because Africa does not need charity. Africa needs solidarity. Africa needs solidarity. So hopefully there's solidarity here. Um, Africa, you know we have so much work to do to liberate and unify our Africa and our people everywhere. I would like to leave you with a, a slogan that uh, comes from the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania during this revolutionary heyday. It is Zulu. I don't speak any language. I don't even speak English well. And uh, there's a story behind that too. When we have enough time, we'll talk about that. Uh, but in Zulu, it is call and response. I say, is we live too. It means the land is ours. And you say, e Africa, you've identified which land is ours. And I say, e Africa, and if you are African, you say, Izwe le tu. And if you're not African, you say, Izwe le nu, which means that the land is yours. If you want. I love that slogan. Can you work with me? Izwe le tu. E Africa. E Africa. Izwe le tu. Thank you so much. Uhuru. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Mr. Yoshitela, for your energy, for your provocation, for your, as I told you, brilliant uh, speech. Thank you very much. Uh, you have told a very important thing, that uh, people can change the relationship yes. effectively. Uh, this is our time for people. Uh, we start our debate. You can make your questions. Uh, in English, in French, or in Spanish, it's the same thing because uh, our translators can translate. But uh, our translators uh, need to solidarity as Africa, non charity. Yes. Uh, for this yes. reason, please, uh, quiet. Uh, thank you very much. You, uh, who is the, the first? We have microphone. Sorry? Here? In this side? <laughs> we don't have microphone? Cuando digo algo, alguna charla y tal, o sea, 
Hay micrófono. A ver si podemos acercar a alguien que acerque el micrófono allí, porque es que él no está oyendo, ¿sabes? Ya se me ha Yo comentaba. No, o sea que, que me ha encantado su, inter, la interven, su intervención, me ha encantado. El, comparto prácticamente todo lo que ha dicho. Pero me ha faltado oírle algo al final, ¿no? Me ha faltado oírle eh, qué responsabilidad tienen los actuales dirigentes, los gobiernos africanos. Porque desde que empiezan los movimientos independentistas en África, hoy día todos los gobiernos que hay son gobiernos de ciudadanos africanos. Y ellos tienen su responsabilidad, ¿no? Si no, podemos ver el caso más, más concreto de la antigua Guinea española, la Guinea ecuatorial. ¿Cómo se permite esa expoliación del petróleo? ¿Cómo esas multinacionales norteamericanas están haciendo eso? ¿Qué dice el gobierno de Guinea? ¿Qué dicen los gobiernos africanos? ¿Qué dicen los gobiernos donde se les traen tantas riquezas? No sé, eso es lo que me gustaría eh, oír. Pero lo demás, nada, encantado con lo que usted ha dicho. Y felicitarlo, no lo comparto absolutamente. Pero me falta eh, oírle a usted ese punto de vista de los gobiernos africanos. Gracias. Thank you very much uh, for that question. I did not uh, speak that much about African governments. I did mention uh, I did mention it in passing, particularly this thing that Kwame Nkrumah referred to as neo-colonialism, uh, which is a new social arrangement based on uh, uh, an economic relationship that was imposed on Africa subsequent to so-called independence. And uh, the fact is that uh, there have been these flag independence, as they refer to often in Africa, uh, where uh, uh, oftentimes former colonial masters uh, will participate in ceremonies, sometimes even help to write the constitutions. Uh, they will give a new flag. Uh, And with great ceremony, they would uh, ship out uh, uh, at uh, 1201 to, uh, representing symbolically the beginning of a new era. Uh, but what is left out of view for most people is that the economy is, is still controlled by the same forces who, who were there before. That's why we say it is uh, white power and blackface. And that at best, the uh, Africans uh, become administrators of uh, economic interests that are still held by the colonial powers. And when those Africans, uh, should they ever dare uh, to challenge that relationship, as did Nkrumah, uh, you find forces uh, like the United States government who worked to overthrow Nkrumah, uh, Lumumba, uh, who was uh, killed by French, Belgium, and US together, uh, and other leaders of that, of that nature. So what you have uh, is uh, uh, this uh, uh, a form of uh, brutal, Uh, uh, a manipulation that is imposed uh, on Africa. And then uh, you have uh, in schools all over Europe and North America institutions uh, that are designed to train uh, so-called African leaders uh, to become servile, malleable forces that will protect the interests of imperialism and the United States. And, should the, uh, uh, and that's the kind of relationship. And that's why they talk about the AFRICOM particularly in a, an era of a growing crisis of imperialism, as oppressed peoples around the world increasingly struggle to take control of their resources, such as in the Middle East, it becomes absolutely necessary for armed force and naked armed force to become an aggressor. We have entered an era into uh, uh, an era of a war without end. Well, in fact, that's what uh, Bush has defined it. This war against terrorism doesn't define an enemy. It uh, appears to be anything that scares white people. But, uh, uh, So, so this is the relationship that we're looking at. And yes, uh, now you have these thugs who are in power in, uh, in Guinea that could not stay there for 30 days without the support of the Spanish government or other imperialist powers. And uh, the same government, for example, that claim they are invading 
uh, Iraq right now. Uh, uh, uphold uh, for democracy, uh, uh, responsible for imposing terrible dictatorship on masses of people throughout the world. That's the kind of relationship we live with. But I agree, Africans have a primary responsibility. Our responsibility ultimately as Africans is, is, not, is going to have to be to remove those governments, to remove them, because uh, the fact is that uh, the neocolonialism and the neocolonial borders uh, serve only for the extraction of value, leaving Africa going to Europe and to North America, and also for the purpose of reproducing the African neocolonial petty bourgeoisie as a social force. That is, that is the, that's the only service that those borders have. They have to go. And uh, ultimately, it's going to take a mass movement of African people on the ground, grassroots organizations on the ground, to overturn them because uh, they're not willingly going to leave. Alors, je pense que vous viens de... Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je vous remercie. Euh, je voudrais poser euh, quelques questions. Euh, parce que je vous ai entendu dire... Excusez-moi, euh, voulez-vous parler plus soir Je vous ai entendu dire euh, quelque part que vous travaillez en Afrique. Euh, et, euh, sur la liste des pays que vous avez énumérés, je n'ai entendu euh, comme pays francophone que la Guinée. Qu'est-ce qui fait que vous travaillez seulement dans les pays africains, mais anglophones C'est la première question. La deuxième question, euh, depuis quelque temps, on nous parle de réparation, de réparation. Et euh, je voudrais savoir euh, si un jour l'Europe acceptait ou les États-Unis acceptaient de réparer euh, en ce qui concerne l'esclavage, à qui ils allaient verser l'argent. J'espère que ce n'est pas à nos gouvernements qui vont reverser l'argent. Donc, il faudrait qu'on sache si on réparait cette faute à qui on, allait, on va euh, verser euh, ce montant-là. Je vous remercie. Je suis Seyna Boutal, euh, présidente de l'association Femmes, Enfants, Environnement du Sénégal. Merci. C'est bien. Ah, splendide. Thank you so much for that question, um, because that is a real question, not only uh, for Africans in Africa, I want to say two things about that, not only for Africans in Africa,